right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, plenty of seats over here. But thank you for joining us on the third day of Unite for, for our session on, ooh, enabling autonomy at scale using Unity's new simulations platform. I'm Kevin Saito. I'm the Principal Pro Product Manager for Simulations. My co-presenter is Vlad Oster, who's a tech lead for simulations. Okay? So we're going to talk to you about the new Unity simulation platform. At its core, our platform is about solving one key problem, infrastructure, for the purpose of helping you generate play data, game, analy game analysis, or generating data for synthetic, synthetic data for training machine learning models. We'll talk to you today about three primary use cases that we found during our alpha program product, which is robotics, autonomous vehicles, and game testing. And then I'll hand it over to Vlad to talk about how we generate synthetic data, how our service works, and give you a brief demo of what we built. Okay? All right, so the first use case we want to talk about today is robotics. So today, the way robotic, robots are quote unquote taught primarily involves the process of machine teaching, which is really no more than a developer hard coding a robot to do a specific set of tasks on a very fixed and defined basis. Now, that's great for if you know exactly what you want to do and it, it never changes. However, in our modern economy where things, demands change, there's seasonal demand for new products and new, new type of scenarios or new distribution environments, you have to think about ways to be more flexible. What you can do today, actually using machine, a combination of machine learning and unique simulations, is actually train your robots to, to using reinforcement learning to flexibly do more tasks and to be able to anticipate scenarios that you could never program, like someone walking through a factory floor or different packaging environments that could be changing based on seasonal demand. Okay? So what we have for you is a, just a brief, brief demo. And this demo involves, uh, was built by one of our internal groups and involves a universal robot, six-jointed -armed, six armed robot. Go, go ahead and play the video, Vlad. So this whole thing was built using ProBuilder and using the ML Agent Toolkit within Unity. In your first scene, what you see is a robot just basically learning what to do, just moving its arm. In your second scene, you see the robot much more fluid, learning to identify the table um, and identify where things are, where the boundaries are. In this third scene, the robot's even more fluid. And what it's actually able to do is pick up, and pick up boxes and move it into the bin and recognize the difference between the big boxes and the small boxes. This is all done using, obviously, Unity Builder, Pro Builder, which helped us generate the environments, and ML Agents Toolkit, which is essentially where we drove a reinforcement learning algorithms from. Okay? This is one scenario that you could do. And the key thing is we were able to accelerate the development of this into, in, terms of we, in terms of weeks instead of the months it takes typically to program any robot, robotic task using the power of the cloud and the scale that we can bring. In the second scenario is autonomous vehicles. You've all heard in a keynote how it takes basically 11 billion miles to consider an autonomous vehicle road safe. The primary reason for this is the number of situations that you have to prepare your algorithms to handle. Some of them involving fog, some of them involving different pedestrian patterns, weather, lighting, things like that. So what you can do with Unity's simulation service is you basically can create a scenario where you have a single environment, and you no longer have to wait for things like varying weather patterns, varying traffic patterns, varying traffic obstacles to naturally occur in your normal driving situation. You can actually code them in to dynamically and randomly populate and see if your algorithm can handle them appropriately. So you want to play the video of that? So this, you see in this video, the car is just driving to the street. You notice something that you probably don't see all very often, which is a porta potty tipped over in the middle of the road. You obviously, your vehicle needs to know, need to know how to handle that. And in this situation, you can train and dynamically populate that road construction, changing weather patterns like rain, or potentially even fog. All of this thing, all of this happens one environment, one scale test, one sort of process that you can move through, even nightfall and changing, changing things like pedestrian patterns or uh, road vehicles. And the whole premise of this is you no longer have to wait for them to be organically observed, and you can just move forward and test at scale very quickly on a wider range of variables. Okay? All right. Ooh. So this scenario that probably I think most of you are here for is our game testing scenario that we talked about in the keynote. Uh, in, this key, in this video, we'll show Illogica's road racer game. And in this game, you basically have a scenario where you have two racers running through a course. Um, one of the key problems that Logic was looking for is making sure that one racer didn't get too far ahead of the other. It's sort of a bounding problem because it keeps the game competitive and doesn't have to, you don't have to be in a scenario where you have to group players by skill level to keep the competitive environment. Um, as, part of their, as part of their testing, 
So as part of their te testing, Illogic ran a grid search that considered 22,500 scenarios. And what they're trying to do is evaluate the, the sort of the distribution of three specific parameters. Uh, they, looked at the, they looked at the scenario, they completed the entire test in roughly four to eight hours, I think, and they were able to quickly determine what the proper setting is for these three parameters for their game by looking at the normalized distribution of outcomes for, the entire, for all the combinations of player sets. All right, so with that, let me hand it over to Vlad to talk to you about synthetic data and the platform. Hi. Uh, I'm Vlad, I'm a, a tech lead for uh, Unity Simulation, and I want to talk to you a little bit about why would you want to use Unity Simulation to run your simulations in the cloud. So apart from the fact that uh, our managed infrastructure allows you a relatively quick start and uh, you don't need to ramp up with uh, uh, cloud infrastructure yourself, apart from that, we are also using a special Unity build that uh, gives you performance optimizations uh, and other advantages for running Unity in the cloud, as well as headless GPU rendering in the cloud. So essentially, you can uh, run your simulations with uh, full GPU rendering on powerful NVIDIA GPUs on Google Cloud. So uh, one of the scenarios I want to talk to you about, and uh, that will be the demo I will uh, show in a little bit, is synthetic data generation. Uh, modern uh, machine learning applications uh, require huge amounts of data. And just as an example, the ImageNet uh, catalog of images, labeled images, took about two and a half years to assemble and label. In the cloud, you can generate millions of images just in days using multiple instances of your uh, content generation simulation uh, in the cloud. Uh, we've partnered with Google Cloud to uh, give you seamless execution of your simulations um, on both CPU and GPU hardware available uh, on GCP. So uh, what is the process of using uh, Unity simulation? So, of course, first we need the simulation. Uh, we upload the simulation and any other relevant data that is needed to run it. We select what kind of hardware do we want to run our simulation on. We run the simulation. And in the end, we can download the generated data, as we will see in a few minutes. Before we actually start the demo, I wanted to talk a little bit about what kind of artifact Unity simulation uses, so that we are speaking the same language while uh, we're uh, uh, seeing the demo. So there are four main artifacts that uh, you should be aware of. First of all is the Unity build. That's the actual simulation that is running in the cloud. The second artifact is the app params. So uh, as Kevin mentioned, uh, Illogica ran multiple instances of their simulation. And of course, you would imagine that different instances needed different parameters. So upparam is the object that controls uh, how the simulation runs. The third artifact is the run definition. This is kind of um, an object that binds everything together. So it includes what kind of simulation we want to run, what kind of hardware do we want to run it on, how many instances do we want to run, and uh, uh, which app params do we want to run it with. And of course, in the end, uh, once we uh, finish running the simulation, we have our download manifest, which has all the links to download the data you have generated, whether it's images, um, logs, or any other uh, information. So let's uh, take a look at a small demo. So uh, the demo is uh, of uh, semantic segmentation. It's essentially taking every pixel on the screen and attaching it to a label according to what that pixel represents. We're going to uh, segment our image into uh, three labels, a cube, a sphere, and a cylinder. Uh, in our simulation, we have two cameras. One is a regular camera, just takes uh, direct images of, uh, of uh, our objects. The second uh, is a special camera that uses a segmentation shader that segments the pixels according to the attached tag uh, to the tag attached to the object. So let's take a look. All right. So we're not going to build the simulation in Unity where uh, we already have that. So uh, we can see the segmentation seems zip. It's just a regular Linux build, um, zipped and ready to go to the cloud. We have our USIM uh, executable, and we have a sample uh, app params file. Let's take a real quick look. Um, it just specifies how long do we want to run the simulation, um, how often do we want to capture images uh, in the simulation, and how many cameras do we want. 
All right, so, so the first thing we want to do is actually upload our build. So upload build. Of course, I should probably spell it correctly. So uh, currently, uh, the simulation is just being uploaded, stored on uh, Google Cloud Storage uh, with any uh, metadata that we need uh, in order to run it. And I guess the Wi-Fi here is not as fast as we would want. Yeah, so uh, this simulation is about 50 megabytes. Uh, it, it's a pretty small simulation, as, as you saw in the uh, uh, video uh, in the slides. But it should be up there in a few more seconds. To entertain you while you wait, there is a fancy progress bar. Uh, all right, yeah, it's up. Uh, so we have uh, the um, build ID. We don't actually need it uh, right now, but uh, uh, later we might need to um, access it. All right. So the next thing we're going to do, and this should go a lot faster, is to upload the upper arms uh, that we have just seen. All right, that was a lot faster. Um, next, uh, uh, and uh, just, just to uh, show you, let's take a look at the builds that are uh, up there. So you can see there are two builds, one from a uh, uh, simulation I ran last night and one from uh, just now, and we can see when it was uploaded. And same, we can look at upper arms. All right, same thing, one from yesterday, one from today. So now we have all our uh, objects on the cloud, and we want to actually uh, schedule the simulation. So uh, we will define a run, and you can think of a run as a class which defines uh, how we want to run our simulation, and each execution is an actual object of that class. So um, let's define a run. Perfect. So how will we call it? Let's give it a descriptive name. Description. Demo run. All right. So as I mentioned before, this is what ties everything together. We're selecting which build we want to run. So let's take the build we've just uploaded, although they're pr pretty much the same. What kind of hardware do we want to run it on? And this is an important note, of course, don't expect things to run in the cloud on less hardware than you would uh, run it uh, locally. For example, a laptop is eight cores. Uh, you wouldn't want to run something on like one CPU and expect it to run faster than on your local machine. So uh, for this case, we'll just take uh, the smallest uh, machine, six CPUs, 22 and a half uh, gigabytes of memory. What kind of app arms do we want to run? So we have uh, the ones we've just uploaded. How many instances we want to run? So uh, let's take just two instances. And uh, once the run is scheduled, we will allocate uh, the instances you have requested. And if we don't have enough, we will just uh, uh, scale and spin up more instances uh, for your simulation. Uh, do we have any more app arms to include? Nope, not today. All right, let's save the run. Upload it to the cloud. Excellent. So uh, now we're ready to actually uh, run the simulation. So execute run. And let's take the ID of the run we have just uploaded. All right, perfect. It has been scheduled, we have the ID, so this ID is more important to kind of uh, take a note of because we will be using it to, uh, to get the status of our simulation. So uh, let's look at the status. Uh, run execution, use sim summarize run execution, and let's take our execution we have just scheduled. Excellent, so it's in progress. It hasn't been scheduled uh, yet, but it will be scheduled in a few minutes. Uh, so the excitement of watching a simulation run is only comparable to watching paint dry or a pot boil. So we're not going to actually wait for the simulation to complete, but we'll rather take the simulation I ran last night and uh, download its artifacts, which are uh, exactly the same as the artifacts uh, this simulation is going to provide. So 
let's take a look at uh, at the runs. Next run, so we have the execution that I ran last night. It's aptly named prep run. And uh, we're going to get the uh, download manifest. Download manifest. Excellent. So we have our CSV file. Let's take a quick look at it. Perfect. So uh, what do we have here? Uh, we have all the files that has been uh, generated by the simulation. In this case, we have images generated by the regular camera. We have images generated by the uh, segmentation camera. And we have the player log, just uh, if we want to see what, what was actually uh, going on. So what I want to show you is take uh, two images uh, taken by two different cameras at the same moment, just so you can see the difference. And we're gonna, uh, going to download them and take a quick look. So let's take, for example, image number two. So this is the main camera. All right. And let's take the same image from the segmentation camera. Segmentation camera two. There it is. All right, we have uh, both images, and let's take a look at them. Oh. My bad. Uh, where it is? Main camera number two. I will just. All right, so this is the main camera image. And let's look at the segmented camera. Uh, there it is. Perfect. So you can see it's same view, only the first camera just took a regular image, and the second segmented it uh, and labeled uh, each pixel with a different color according, uh, according to the uh, class of that object. All right. Oh, sorry. Uh, cool. Uh, this concludes our demo, and I'll uh, hand the mic back to uh, yeah. Kevin. Yes. So obviously, all of this is live today. So a couple of things we wanted to call out. If you go to uni.com/simulation, you can join our beta program. Um, thanks to the efforts of our partners, Google, we are actually able to offer free tier for everyone to use on sign up. So what that means is, you click sign up and you give us your information, we'll onboard you in a, slow, in a in sort of a graduated fashion, and you get a free tier of usage to evaluate all your pro what you want to do. And if, when you get to ready to say, hey, I'm ready to scale this up, I want to run hundreds or thousands of instances, obviously give us a call and we'll set you up with a paid account that enables you to scale to your heart's delight. Secondly, we have questions. If there are any questions, there are mics located in the back of the room for anyone to just scream something out, or if you've got something and we can hear it. All right, so the question for, the, I guess, for the recording is, what kind of security do we have available on Google Cloud because of potentially sensitive information that you, you're running in your scenarios, correct? If I do want to take that. Sure, yeah, I'll take that. Uh, so uh, we, we have uh, several uh, ways we secure your simulation. One is all the data is encrypted. Uh, the second, uh, every simulation, or every, I would say, uh, project or organization uh, runs in a separate uh, node pool so that uh, there is no uh, connection between uh, two different organizations that can uh, um, uh, allow any vulnerability exploitation. Question here? So the question was, what kind of data can you get back from the simulations apart from the images? Uh, so currently, uh, most of the use cases are uh, images and uh, uh, any data you're just logging from your uh, simulation. But if you have any specific needs, we can talk about it. Yeah. 
Like it's just a matter of uh, figuring out what you want to upload and then uploading it. And I think the other thing is from the use case, especially for robotics, you can use a simulation to actually do the training and generate the algorithmic training itself and the machine learning. So you don't necessarily have to use data for that output, it's more the scenarios and the generations of learning that we accelerate. What else? Cool. No other questions? Oh, one. That's a very good question. Let's take a look. All right. It is done. Two instances successfully finished. If we really want to, we can download its uh, uh, download manifest, but it will be basically the same images uh, that we have just seen. Excellent question. Question over there? Like what, sorry? So we're currently uh, limited but by whatever uh, uh, the cloud has to offer. So once there are mobile phones on the cloud, we will definitely uh, take use of them. Uh, currently, we're not using any like fancy types of hardware on, GP uh, on, on the cloud, like TPUs and stuff like that. But if there is a need, we can expand to that uh, area. Come again? Yes. Uh, so. We're currently not running on other clouds that, uh, than a Google Cloud Platform, uh, but perhaps in the future we will consider expanding to uh, wherever our customers are. Yeah, you should, this is one of the scenarios we understand customer workflows exist on different cloud environments, and we will work to be where our customers are as, in an appropriate time frame. Of course, yeah, so uh, for uh, automotive purposes, uh, there are two main scenarios that we can see. One is running your car with your model in the cloud, just to uh, expedite the number of um, hours driven. And second is generating data for uh, uncommon or common scenarios. Like for example, in GTA uh, you have a, a scene where uh, there is a grandmother in a wheelchair running after a duck. So in real world, it's hard to encounter this situation, but in the simulation, you can uh, come up with whatever, um, whatever situation you would like to train your uh, vessel. Uh, could you repeat that? Yeah, so, so I mean, will, will your Google Cloud Sim you have set up mm -hmm. be able to generate enough um, new performance or GPU performance to uh, generate all the simulations? Oh, yes, of course. We, we, we auto scale uh, according to uh, whatever um, load uh, we have, and uh, we can reserve as, m as many uh, instances as we need for our customers. Yeah, if you have a scenario that will require 20,000 instances running in a full world environment, we would love to talk to you, obviously. Yeah, like, of course, if you need 20,000 GPUs, it, we will need to talk about it and we will need to talk to Google about it, uh, but it is possible. Yes. It, it wasn't picture based, right? So I mean, there was, to be fair, there was some analytics put into it as well, and that allowed them to see on a normal distribution what the outcomes are for in terms of the finish times against each of the variable combinations. So there was a distribution they were able to anal anal analyze at the very end. Okay, so they had analytics. Correct. Okay. Yes. In the back of the room. A uh, reasonable number of GPUs we have access to. Um, currently, maybe a couple hundreds, uh, but uh, once we have customers actively using them, we can increase that number. Yeah. 
So it's relatively easy for us to increase based on what the requirements of the customers are. And you know, typically what we'll see is ramping usage, and then we have calls with Google on a very frequent basis to adjust our, no, our CPU and GPU pools. Currently, we're only located uh, in uh, US Central, but we're planning to expand to other time zones. And this is one of those things like when we see where our customers are located and where, what provides sort of the lowest latency possible, we can sort of increase the number of nodes or clusters that we have available to them in more of their local regions. Days. Definitely. So if you've got a, it sounds like you have a very custom solution and custom situation that you, you want to talk to. Let's have a conversation after the session and we can talk about what type of support we can provide using all the resources, including professional services that Uni has to offer. Any other questions? Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you.